in League of Legends, not every champion is meant to put on a show. In the game's early days, AD carries in particular were used to playing safely, positioning carefully in team fights, and waiting for the right chance to carry the day. But one champion broke the mold. He gave ADCs the spotlight and let them pick their own moment to shine. Oh! 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 It gets him! No! No way! He inspired the game's player base. And throughout the game's history, pro players saw something in Ezreal the Prodigal Explorer, too. And it's up on Faker, but Teddy is alive! And Teddy's trying to go 1v3! He gets another one! And he's gonna get Teddy! another reset! Man, Teddy is so gigantic! It was the opportunity to grasp perfection and wield it against their opponents. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, oh, indeed. Hooney looks like he's going down. The red buff is ticking away. <laughs> and Bang is dominating. These mechanical gods craved the skill expression Ezreal enabled, and the champion fit them like a glove. And they're looking to make their way to the quarterfinals. Do they run fast enough? <laughs> True shot This is the story of Ezreal. Hey everyone, before we get into the video, we wanted to let you know that we've worked with Bose to create their new Rule the Quiet videos, which follow key storylines at Worlds. Here's a sneak preview. Check out the link below for more Rule the Quiet videos. And thanks to Bose for sending over these awesome quiet comfort earbuds. Now, back to the story of Ezreal. At the beginning of League of Legends, AD carries had a certain archetype. They were based around auto attacks. Many of them could augment their auto attacks, and some had other tools for spacing out opponents like snares, slows, or movement abilities. And they pretty much all built attack damage. After all, that's what the AD stands for. So when Ezreal was released in March 2010, he had a couple clear differences from the usual template. For one, he was built from the ground up for damage. Specifically, the kit's low cooldown skill shots encouraged players to push their accuracy to the limit to make the best use of his passive trait, which increased his attack speed when a damaging ability landed. Of course, other ADCs had skill shots, but none of them needed to hit them as consistently and frequently as Ezreal. The cat goes into the backside, is right uh, to Skara. He is shredding Soaz and Diamond right now. The first kill's going off full house to Soaz. They are still going. So in short, cast lots of skill shots, hit lots of skill shots, get attack speed and weave in plenty of auto attacks between those skill shots, all while playing fairly close to the front of the team fight due to his short auto attack range. I think that if you get down to the brass tacks of what makes Ezreal amazing in competitive play is that if you're not very good at League of Legends, Ezreal feels like the worst champion in the universe. That's it. Unlike other AD carries, though, Ezreal didn't have a slow root or stun. Instead, he had a short-range flash that also did damage. If you overextended, the consequences were dire. And he comes back into this lane. Might be a good time for Faker to get back as a hook gonna land on Tamandu here, down in that bottom lane, but Piglet gonna dive in there. Kane, Julie gonna fall from this one. Piglet picks up that kill. Oh, Prey oh, tries to get the kill. kill. 
He's not got him though. Bray going super low, and he will fall. Piglet picks up the double. I know our analyst desk is going to have something to say about that bottom lane mechanics because Prey missed a couple shots there and then didn't even finish off the support trade. And in much the same way that it was easy to detect a bad as real play, a truly skilled player turned the performance into a dance of death. A light show for the audience. The jump in from Impact to equalize the laser on the red carpet, but they're all off of it already. They've entered into the fight. Royals health bars are just getting demolished. Uzi on the outside trying to do what he can, but it's not going to be enough. Uzi's chased into the base, and SCP wipes him for the ace, the Quadra. When you see instant cleanse into Arcane Shift, into managing to land all of your skill shots, fade away mystic shots, you know, all of that sort of control. The fact that Ezreal throughout his entire time, no matter what build he'd gone, it's always very impactful when you see him do these things. Ezreal didn't only capture the hearts of the competitive audience, he became a staple of the game. He was the first champion in League of Legends to receive a champion spotlight video. And Ezreal's character, two parts anime protagonist, one part Indiana Jones, became a favorite as the game exploded in global popularity. He received the game's first ultimate skin and was the first champion to have 13 different skins. Ezreal's potential for flashy plays and Devil May Care attitude earned him fans across League of Legends. His unique blend of on-hit synergy and short skill shot cooldowns meant that even though he often still built AD items, he had a greater emphasis on mana and on mechanical precision. There was just one problem. Back in the early days, it wasn't clear exactly how he would fit into the game's developing meta, until one legendary AD carry player showed us just how high the ceiling truly was. I think that you can't mention Ezreal first without mentioning that Wei Zhao did it first. He was the god of Ezreal, and this goes back 10 years, right? So, has to be said. In League of Legends early days, international competition was different. It was a time where standalone tournaments flourished and were unique opportunities to test the region's metal against each other. During those first couple years, there were a lot of candidates for the greatest AD carry in the game. But for many, China's Wei Zhao was the finest mechanical player at the position and he agreed. At least in the West, a lot of people think that you and Doublelift are the two best AD carries in the world. Uh, are you the best AD carry in the world? Are you better than Doublelift? I think I'm better as an AD carry. As part of World Elite, Wei Zhao became perhaps China's first true international LOL superstar. And it was a reputation built on excellence both in lane and in team fights. It's fitting then that Wei Zhao was also the first player to truly push Ezreal to his limits. Oh my goodness, this could be so, so close. Heal there, true shot barrage, so much damage. Wei Zhao Wei outplays Zhao him. Completely outplays him. And now comes Insect to clean it up. Oh, it's close, can he do it, he does. Wei Zhao, what a hero. At IPL5, World Elite faced the strongest competition the world had to offer. In the grand finals, they toppled Fnatic and Wei Zhao's Ezreal was a big reason why. A little oh, bit no. of damage, and here they come around the side, and Rayton having to flash over the top, but there he's oh. going from the side. First one, Wei Zhao, and there's the exhaust oh, as well. Dear. The second coming down for Lulu. What a start for World Elite. And the ward gives their position away. There's three members of Fnatic split away here. They're not too sure which way to run. Ragnarok it's going to be bottom. the charm. Ragnarok comes in, and Rayton is going to get around. There's going to be Ragnarok straight in there, Salme. And that is going to be a free power, and there's just nothing Fnatic can do about that. Fnatic sent two members into the bottom lane to try to kill Olaf. Xiaomi, again, with sp being the split push master, just gives them this free Baron. There's nothing they can do against it. Oh my god, look at Wei Zhao's items. Infinity Edge, Phantom Dancer, Last Whisper, and an Executioner's Calling. That's a build cap right now. It multiplies so well with what he's doing with Nunu right now. This dive is, if, if they fight here, even if they tank the turret, it's going to be so hard for Fnatic to stay in it. Will Elite hanging outside. 
of that base. Here we go then, gonna put some pressure down. Charm actually lands onto Chao Mei. There comes the ultimate out of Zyra as well. Oh, Will the League gonna back away. Messiah's right in the middle as he pops his on Zaga. Here comes the rest of the team. The unstoppable force came out, but it wasn't really enough. They do take down Messiah, but everybody else is in trouble. Sao Mei completely tanking, reckless down, and rated in trouble. They're all caught out by the tower. Pique having to use his ultimate to try and avoid the damage. It's a triple kill for Wei Zhao though. He is stomping through the Peke goes down. It's a ultimate ace there. Let's hear it, ladies and gentlemen. Team World Elite, the winners of the IGN Pro League 5 here in Las Vegas. Fantastic performance. World Elite didn't become a dominant dynasty like we see from Korea in the years to come. And Wei Zhao retired relatively early in 2014 after a series of disappointing results and a missed chance at Worlds qualification. But if you followed League back then and you wanted to see the cutting edge of Ezreal play, you didn't need to look further than China's original ADC god. For every champion that has like a, a sick play or a, uh, a damage ceiling that we don't know about, there is a player to find that out. And, you know, it happened with Orianna as well. You know, a player like, uh, like Faker demonstrated that this champion isn't too hard. But you have to put things in the context of the amount of experience people have, and Wei Zhao is the one that showed us first just how much damage Ezreal can do in a short period of time. In 2015, as Korea cemented itself as a League of Legends powerhouse, it was only fitting that two of its greatest ADCs found an outlet for their mechanics in Ezreal. But despite their shared homeland and position, Bang and Deft approached the champion quite differently. As part of SK Telecom T1, Bang played Ezreal in a much different context than Wei Zhao. He could carry games for his team, but unlike Wei Zhao, he didn't have to, because he was on the greatest team in League of Legends history. So throughout SKT's golden age and beyond, Bang played a style of Ezreal that was more akin to a pocket ace. Sometimes, even when he made good individual plays, he could count on his team to make better ones and enable Ezreal's incredible damage in the process. He's trying to dance, but that poke from Ezreal is incredibly dangerous. You can see how much respect they're giving Bang right now. Oh yeah. 37 yeah. minutes into this game, this guy is nuts. Oh, Duke went back. And it's a 4v5 right now. Gorilla very low. Smeb looking for a way to come from the side, but again, Bang's such a big threat. It's not stopping them from going out to this Baron, though. Oh, here we go, coming in. Smeb does some damage. He's all over Bangy. Meanwhile, the counter engage. Faker comes in and ults himself. Duke getting in the back lines, too. Kuro still okay. Bangy, wow, Bang managed to take out Smeb. Bang! He's coming back into this fight. He could win it for SKT. And now Bang and the rest of SKT. Holy cow! Triple kill! For Bang, quadra. quadra kill! Bang with the Quadra and SK Telecom. They find a way, man. Other times, he saw opportunities others might not, and he never hesitated to take them. They can take a lot if SKT get a little sloppy here and, you know, walk towards one of those brush where they don't have vision. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, indeed. Hooney looks like he's going down. The red buff is ticking away, <laughs> and Bang is dominating. With this sweat, cool guys don't look at explosions, Peel. <laughs> Rather than push himself to play aggressively in lane even before Ezreal hit his two-item power spike, and with legendary support Wolf at his side to initiate favorable fights, he was able to take the highest percentage plays while keeping himself safe. Now, the way Bang played uh, Ezreal was a little bit different because I felt like there was a time where Bang was put on Ezreal duty that it was mainly so that Wolf could go and kill people. And when Bang was on Ezreal, he was just not able to be killed. What Bang had in, you know, the years when SKT were at the height of their dominance was just obscene levels of consistency. And I think a champion like Ezreal, if you're consistent on Ezreal, means you're landing a lot of uh, a lot of skill shots and doing a lot of abilities in exactly the way that you need to. So that's why he stands out to me. While he may not have been the flashiest Ezreal, Bang wasn't really trying to be. On a team like SKT, he didn't have to stomp his lane to win the game. He just had to ensure they didn't lose it. Standing in contrast to Bang's steady hand was the flashy Deft, who first made a name for himself in 2014 as part of the LCK's Samsung Blue. 
he was someone who relished team fights and found ways to embarrass even the toughest opponents. And Def comes into the back lines, Arcane shifting into the base to get two kills already. Dade way deep into the base. He wants a bit of the action as well. One kill for him, a triple kill now for Deft, and that is a clean ace, and that has got to be the game. But after a semi-final exit at Worlds 2014 to sister team Samsung White, Deft did something unexpected. He was one of several Korean stars to move to the LPL for the 2015 season when he accepted an offer from Edward Gaming. Deft, before he actually left uh, Korea, he was known more as a teamfight positioning player. He was playing things like the Twitch. He's always been a fantastic late game carry player. Um, but he was known more for late game positioning, not necessarily for aggressive laning. And in China, he changed. Sure, he still had the team fight prowess that had made him a star. But as he teamed up with Mako to become one of the most dangerous bot lanes in the game, he took on more of the responsibility to pressure his opponents early. And that change included Ezreal, a champion that had a reputation for a limited early game and a heavy reliance on items. Wow, the damage coming out of death, very real, and you see the slow up, how useful it is. Let's be just under a clear, taking so much damage just from Zhao Hu alone. Koro diving into the back line, and death actually kills Sync Dream there off to the side, but Huey gonna dive in. A good off from Maker will disengage him. Koro now into the back line onto tail. Death going very aggressive forward, and Koro just taking up so much damage. Blue Ezreal keeping everyone in place. Tail will go down next as well and EDG, a beautiful fight will finish in an ace. Yeah, clean ace as well. No one going down. Death, the star of that team fight. Able to keep up with everyone. Slowed everyone. The AoE. And his prowess with the champion continued even after he returned to play in Korea in 2017. It feels like okay. Hawaii must have to win, but Kings aren't going to fight anyway. Kings don't want to make the perspective the double oh! knock off. Put in the backside. Hey, it's Dash. for Bane as Temp is going to try to get away from this one, but does go down. And with the two carries gone, as you mentioned, it looks like Hamalaya going to maybe be gone in this fight as a triple kill. Watching Def play, he was just able to get more able to get more out of the champion and i think that it's good champion design when you can have a player manage to stand out like that when we'd already been through a lot of competitive years of this game this champion had been out since the very beginning and we were still seeing that personal flair actually being represented in a champion that you know everyone should have so many games on and so many hours of playtime on Wei Zhao, Bang, and Deft showed Ezreal's potential in the hands of a mechanical mastermind. But despite the potential for burst damage and outplays, Ezreal wasn't always a viable pick, and there were times where he virtually disappeared from the meta. Whether it was outright disasters like the Juggernaut patch, or just firm metas like Ardent Sensor, the Prodigal Explorer sometimes wasn't able to discover a way to get drafted in a role where the meta often had an outsized impact. There were also times when the champion's interaction with certain mana or on-hit items made him an incredibly powerful pick. Even making mid lane appearances, like during the pre nerf Runeglaive Ezreal period. Faker is still no flash. Score coming in, takes some turret hits. They're gonna try to slow him. Faker just arcane shifts away. Oh, the Agnes Embrace comes out. Pickaboo gets picked off by that true shot barrage. Nice bait, actually, bringing him right into the clutches of Banky and SKT. Not done quite yet. Here comes Marin up from the bottom line. Faker with more damage onto Nogne. Nice headbutt pulverize, another kill. But after a 2018 visual makeover and gameplay rework, Ezreal was ready to continue being one of the most exciting champions at his position. Time for a true display of skill. In modern League of Legends, a lot is asked of pro players. Champions are continuously added, and those new champions often have kits far more complex and versatile than their predecessors. Mechanical prowess is the expectation now. But there are still standout Ezreal players, like Teddy. After two years of struggle with the perennial underdog Jin Air Greenwings, Teddy stepped into Bang's spot on SKT and continued his legacy of Ezreal greatness. Now we got Baker in here, the Baron goes the way of Gen T, but the cleanup is coming in for T1 and more and more stopwatches come through. Kana is just gonna go down and Rascal is playing an awesome game here, able to come back 
from this huge deficit, and now they got the combo again, and it's up on Faker, but Teddy is alive, and Teddy's trying to go 1v3, he gets another one, and he's gonna get Teddy! another reset. Man, Teddy is so gigantic. And despite being expected and typically required to carry Jin Air during those lean years, Teddy still played a conservative early game on the champion, giving him the chance to get to the late game and make a difference for his team. When Teddy gets Ezreal, he actually plays very differently. And I sort of got introduced to how good he was on the champion during the blue Ezreal meta, right? Where he was playing a lot more defensively. And it was so fun to be able to watch both him and Deft play against one another because Deft is still very aggressive in lane, still plays very far forward even when he plays Ezreal. And when they switch back, Teddy has a much more subdued approach and plays out the lane much more slowly. And then always, just always manages to deliver um, later on in the game. In terms of pros, there are few with a better record on Ezreal. At the time of recording, Teddy has a 68.2% win rate on 66 pro games with the Prodigal Explorer, boasting a 9.4 KDA. And he's so into the champion, he's even adopted his hair. If pros like Teddy and his predecessors fell in love with Ezreal, it's not hard to see why. No champion before him, and perhaps none after, gave an AD carry the opportunity to shine so brightly, to make plays that dazzled and defied expectations. That was a scenario where he was probably dead in 99.9% .9 of scenarios where Ultra Prime played correctly. And oh! Oh! It gets him! No! No way, LWX! That was sick! And for fans, that skill expression is exciting too. But whether it's the insane outplays... Oh, it's in the back of the base! He has a wave at his back door as well! And they're looking to make their way to the quarterfinals! Do they run fast enough? True Sharp Mirage is the ace! And the last hope of Europe is still alive! Or the champion's style and confidence. Some people call me a hero. Their word, not mine. But it does have a nice ring to it. Ezreal has clearly captured the imagination of pro players and fans alike. But the ulti comes in, Devour is brilliant. True Shot Baraz comes oh. down, that's gonna be the end of the trundle. This is, ladies and gentlemen, why you pick the Ezreal. Thanks for watching. If you want more content like this, hit the sub button and ring the notification bell. For unique bite-sized videos you won't find anywhere else, hit us up on our Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok.